Okay, so what we'd like to do is just start with some introductions. Like uh, your name obviously is showing up here, but a little bit about you, um, what you're doing, who you're working with for your graduate uh, studies, and then a fun fact and a boring fact. Hmm. Okay, I will start uh, with me. So Pam Ishmael, faculty here at the University of Minnesota. I've been here for about 14 years. Um, area of expertise, obviously proteins and a lot of other um, things, little things we do in the lab, not related to protein, but mostly analytical chemistry, um, food chemistry that is. Fun fact, I love to play tennis and I'm very, very competitive. So um, I don't play with friends because then our friendship will be broken. I play only in leagues that I don't know anybody um, there. So but I haven't played for a while, so I miss playing. Um, boring fact, I'm workaholic. So I work a lot. And unfortunate for my student, I expect a lot from them. Um, but I try not to at times. So Okay, so I'm just going to go around and um, based on who I see in the camera and we'll do, um, we'll go with introductions. Moi? Hey, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Moa Delisa. I'm a master's student and I work with Dr. Kumar. I, I haven't had anything in my mind right now about fun facts, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't going there. Okay. Nothing comes to mind? No. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Paul? I'm Paul Donlevy. I work with George, working on a evaluating the effects of dehydration on a, a seed, on its antioxidants and starch properties. Fun fact about me, I recently taught myself how to change the air filters in my car and how to it's so holes in my furniture because my foster dogs have had like to chew on my furniture. And uh, born fact, I hate travel. A lot of people want to go and see all the continents. I'm not afraid of flying. I just have zero need to visit anywhere. Okay, good. Uh, Leslie? Hi, I'm Leslie Lear. I'm a first year master's student in Pam's lab and my project is with intermediate wheatgrass looking at the storage stability over time and how that affects the changes in the chemistry. Um, a fun fact is the town that I am technically from is so small there's not even a gas station. And a boring fact. Hmm. I have no idea. So you're, <laughs> I can you're, not, you're not boring. <laughs> milk. How much milk do you drink? Oh, um, well, now it's just one gallon a week. <laughs> but okay. when I'm at home, between my dad and I, we usually go through like five gallons of milk a week. My goodness, that's why you're that tall. And I feel so short next to you. <laughs> Healthy upbringing. Okay, Nigel. Hi everyone, I'm Nigel. Um, um, I'm a master's student um, working in PAMS lab. I'm working on an uh, oat protein project. It's my first semester here. Um, a fun fact about me is that um, I like playing volleyball. Um, I'm, I am like Pam, I'm also very competitive. When it comes to sports, I like winning. Um, boring fact, I like listening to mainstream music like pop and hip hop and R&B, that kind of stuff, yeah. That's not boring, but okay. <laughs> Chrissy? Hello, hello, I'm Chrissy. I'm, work I'm a first year master's student working in Yobe's lab on texturization of plant proteins and flavor and color generation of meat analogs. Um, a fun fact is that I went ice fishing for the first time this weekend. It was just as boring as expected, but I caught three fish. Um, and my boring fact is that I adopted a dog during quarantine and I'm obsessed with her. Her name is Pancake. Oh, that's the fun part. 
I think the other way around. <laughs> Brigida. Hey everyone, my name is Brigida and I am a first year master's student uh, in PAMS lab. My research focuses on um, chickpea and pea protein um, characterization and texturization to form meat-like fibers. Um, fun fact, I loved, I used to do a lot of horseback riding with my sister a long time ago. Um, boring fact, I eat oatmeal almost every single day for breakfast. Okay, Laura? Hi everyone, I'm Laura. I am a second year master's student also in Pam's lab. I'm doing my research on hemp protein, um, optimizing the extraction for structure, function, and nutritional quality. Um, a fun fact about me is that I play and actually own two saxophones. I have a bachelor's degree in music. Um, and my boring fact is I get a lot of satisfaction out of checking the mail. So. That's a new one. I didn't know that about you, Laura. Okay, Grace. Hi, I'm Grace. I'm a PhD student at the Animal Science Department. My advisor is Dr. Nupul Narjani, and I work with uh, poultry food safety. Uh, my fun fact is I love playing board games. And my boring fact is my favorite, my favorite season is winter because I get to stay indoors more. Mm -hmm. Cool. Kenzie? Hi, I'm Kinsey. This is my um, first year as a master's student here. Um, I'm co-advised by Zeta and Diob, and my project is texturizing plant protein for meat analogs. Um, a fun fact is that I spent my last year of undergrad in New Zealand, and a boring fact is that I'm from Missouri. Thanks, Kinsey. Allie? Um, I'm Ali Snyder. Um, I'm a master's student with Pam studying uh, pea protein in a developing a novel method to um, improve the functionality. Um, a fun fact, um, when I was a kid, I had two guinea pigs named Rudy, <laughs> each of them. And then boring <laughs> fact is I like to keep a clean inbox on my email. Okay, another mail related thing. <laughs> Holly? Hi, everyone. I'm Holly. Um, I'm also a new master's student in tandem with a researcher in Pam's lab. Actually, probably most of you got like a departmental email featuring me this morning. So I feel like that should suffice with my introduction. But <laughs> I guess I'll keep going. Um, I'm working on also protein extraction and optimization um, for the Plant Protein Innovation Center. And then my master's project will work on um, pea protein fractionation and then um, structure and functionality characteristics of different fractions. And a fun fact, I have um, I have uh, also a quarantine puppy, um, nine months. He is now, um, and Kylo is his name. He's a golden retriever. He's been a lot of fun and also a lot of stress. Um, boring fact for me is I basically wear um, the same outfit every day, like leggings and a sweatshirt. So <laughs> just different <laughs> derivations of that. Okay, Devin? Hello, I'm Devin McDonald. This is my second semester as a master's student. I'm in Gary's Flavor Lab. Uh, my project is looking for uh, off aroma compounds and plant protein sources in the crop and uh, seeing how they change with the extraction process. Uh, fun fact is my cat Reggie usually sits on Zoom oh. call. I don't know if you can see him. Reggie, Reggie. There he is. Oh, hi. <laughs> he likes laptops. So I, I try to keep it hard for him to sit in front of the, the camera. Um, <laughs> and a boring fact is I guess I'm like not competitive at all probably compared to you guys. So I like chess, but I don't like to play it. I just watch other people play it. Radhika? Hi, my name is Radhika. I'm a PhD student in uh, George's lab. 
My project is based on uh, optimizing tempering conditions for intermediate wheatgrass and checking its effect on functionality and baking performance. A fun fact about me is I really enjoy dancing, especially Zumba, and I'm taking online classes. I also hold a diploma in Bharatnatyam, which is the Indian equivalent of ballet. Um, and a boring fact is I enjoy organizing everything, folders into files, into kitchen utensils, and I find it very relaxing to just put things in places. Do you want an extra job organizing files for the Ishmael lab? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ben? Hello, uh, my name is Ben Millis. I'm a second year master's and long story short, I'm doing a plan B project on oat protein. Um, my fun fact is that uh, once I went to the hospital from playing chess because I fell and the crown on the queen cut my eyelid. Uh, and my boring fact is I think my camera is still broken because I think I've been frozen this whole time. At least we see your face. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sonali. Hi, I'm Sonal. Okay. Which one is up? Okay, I'll speak. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm Sonali Raghunath, and I'm a second year PhD student, and I work with both Tonya Schoenfunds and Kumar. Um, and my project is based on uh, using a pulse electric field, a non-thermal processing technology to optimize and also study the effect of functionality for uh, dairy proteins. And fun fact is I just realized that my nose is in demand than me. So for sensory, so I get messages, people asking me to borrow my nose instead of me so that and boring fact i like to collect books for smell i don't know why i do that i really like the smell of books but yeah that's a boring fact though <laughs> well, that's interesting thank you everybody so i just want to point out that we do have 13 students that are registered in the class and then we have sonali auditing and then Ben is sitting in on the lectures. So uh, you might see a couple more faces that I will be inviting um, to just attend the class, like a postdoc and um, manager of operation for PPIC. So you might see a couple of people uh, joining in. Also uh, the Zoom meeting is basically on my calendar and everybody can see it and just hop on if they're really interested in, in proteins. So you might see random faces joining um, every now and then. Okay, so what I'll start doing is basically just show you the canvas a little bit and how to navigate uh, through and then walk through the syllabus and the requirement for the class and uh, talk a little bit about the presentation that you would be doing the second half of the semester. And then we'll start. I'll start with intros today. And uh, if time permits, I'll start with uh, the intrinsic factors within the plant, within the proteins. OK, so first I'm going to share my screen here. I'll share the entire screen so that things can pop up without having um, to navigate much. So what you're seeing here is the Canvas uh, website for proteins class. Uh, do navigate through it if you haven't already, but the main component here is the um, modules section. So if you go to modules, you will see um, in the first top part, all the general information. So here there is a folder for the syllabus schedule and student learning outcome. I'll talk about those in a minute. And then you have here presentation information and I'll go through that also later. And underneath there are suggested articles for presentation. And I will tell you why I have this here uh, this year. This is the first time I um, offer this to students, but I'll talk about it when I talk about presentation. 
Uh, you'll see here, uh, sometimes I post sample exams prior to you taking the midterm. Well, actually we have two exams and a final. So you might see here a sample to kind of see what to anticipate. And those here, uh, I have book chapters and reading materials. So uh, if let me click here really quick. So here you can see for every topic, there is a suggested reading material that you can go back and read them, reinforce uh, your knowledge. There are not, it's not obligatory, but it helps uh, with some, some topics we cover. But mostly when you get an exam or anything like a, uh, practice problems or so, it would be based on the lecture that I give you. But these reading material just enforces um, the information. And then usually I post here a key after you take the exam, I post a key so that you can go uh, and look at your answers versus the key. And here also I have additional study material. Over the years, students had questions and sometimes they're lengthy questions and I provide answers. So you find these sometimes helpful. Um, for every week, you'll find a folder with the lecture materials. That's where you find the slides for that particular week. So we meet once. So basically uh, you have the one uh, set of uh, slides for that week. And you'll find also recording of the lecture here. I would appreciate you joining live each time, but uh, for studying purposes and reinforcement of knowledge, you can find the recording here. Um, and sometimes there is a practice problem. So for example, all the practice problems that I encourage you to do are already available. You can see them under different weeks. Once you submit, you will get the key for that set of uh, problems. So basically now you, if you go to week two, you're only going to see the practice problem, but before next Wednesday, this will be available with the lecture uh, slides. I try to update because I only teach this class once every other spring. So there are a lot of things that happen in two years in the protein world. So I try to keep my material relevant and updated. Um, so that's why I don't post them ahead of time because every time I can update and then when they're ready, I post them here. Um, Sometimes there is additional reading material that is uh, that they are encouraged. So you'll find them here. If there are additional, you, they're already available for you. Um, one thing I would say about the practice problems, they are highly encouraged, but they are not part of your grade. They, you get extra credit. So every time you submit your practice problems, you uh, get an additional five points extra credit. Um, so I will let you know which way I would uh, have you submit these potentially via assignment. So I would create an assignment and um, make sure that it doesn't count towards your grade as like part of the grade. It would be an extra credit that will be added later once uh, at the end of the semester. Okay, so this is kind of the, the canvas where you find all the information. Now I'm just going to go through the, uh, let's see here, the syllabus. Oh, before I do, let me just show you this document here. Uh, I call this student learning outcomes. This is kind of a guide for you every time you study a section, you can look here to see if you, um, if you're able to uh, meet those uh, learning objectives. Like, do you understand the importance of proteins uh, in food system? Um, what are some health benefits? Identify quality parameters and so on. So for every section we cover, there, there are bullet points where when you study, you wanna go back to here and see, oh, do, do I know this information? Am I ready for the test or, uh, or ready to be able to talk about the subject. 
Um, and then there's the overall um, learning outcome. So it's a good document to keep track of and visit every time you study. So, okay, now I'll go to the syllabus here. So basically you see here a description, uh, some suggested textbooks, and I have those some of these chapters already on Canvas for you. Uh, some of the course objectives are listed and the topics here. So we will we'll be covering like introduction role of proteins in foods. We're going to cover that today and then go in depth into protein structure. So amino acids, peptides, protein configuration. We're going to cover some protein analysis as well. Um, and then moving on to some properties, protein denaturation and functional properties relating structure to function. And uh, from there, we're going to cover, we have a unit on enzymes, uh, dive deep into the chemistry and kinetics of the enzymes and food applications of these enzymes. Enzymes are proteins mostly. Um, and then from there, we cover different sources of proteins, uh, milk proteins or dairy proteins, legumes, oil seeds, cereal proteins, egg proteins, and some of new uh, proteins or alternative proteins, I will have, I will incorporate them uh, where they best fit. And then last segment will be protein modification. I'm going to talk about very briefly chemical modification because it is not relevant in the US anymore. Um, and then spend some time on enzymatic, on other forms, physical forms, uh, other uh, natural uh, forms of modification biotechnology as well briefly at the end. So there you have two exams. Oh, I need to update those dates. Um, these are carry over, so ignore them for now. I just realized I did not update the dates. I will update the dates and the schedule to include the, the midterm, uh, the not the midterm, sorry, exam one, exam two. So ignore these dates for now. Um, then we have the final. It's not Saturday. It's actually a Friday, and I also need to update this. I don't know why I forgot updating the dates. Um, you get, uh, there's a presentation. So here's a little bit about the presentation. So there is a description here um, for it. I would like you to read very carefully. And also there is a document uh, under presentation information that shows you the topics and what, it, what you can include in your presentation and uh, where to get the suggest or the articles to present. Them. So basically each one of you will be put in a group of two, except one group will have three students. So um, I have here, I grouped you in a way that you guys complement each other. I didn't group you, uh, especially not people from the same lab, um, but you know, where, I, where others can benefit from your knowledge if you already work on proteins or have some uh, knowledge that complement yours. So basically I'm glad I know most everybody. So on that basis, you can write down um, your a group member because I'm gonna tell you right now who will be in your um, team. So the first group uh, is going to be Ali Schneider, Kenzie, and Muath. So you three are going to be in one group. Typically it's a group of two, but because we have odd numbers, um, um, I decided to put three of you together. In this case, you'll be the only group that presents for 30 minutes on three articles rather than two. And um, 30 minutes plus questions time. So a little longer than the other uh, teams. So the other team, I have Laura and Paul. So make sure you exchange emails and see how it was to communicate with each other. And then third, we have Chrissy and Leslie. Fourth, we have Grace and Nigel. Uh, Brigida and Radhika. Holly and Devin. Does anybody want me to repeat? 
or missed. Um, okay. You can always unmute yourself if you have a comment. So basically, what do you what you do is uh, these presentations start. They start. Well, fortunately, the dates here are correct. So these presentations start kind of like mid semester, and uh, the presentations would be on topics we already covered. So that's why strategically the date is linked to the topic because you want to have covered the topic before you present on it. So what I would like you to do uh, within this next week is select your topic, not necessarily on based on the date. I know some most of you want to go last, but please look at the topics and see what is of interest to you, like what's striking, what do you want to learn more about? Um, rather than things that you already know and comfortable with. So uh, challenge yourself and your team member or members and pick a topic you want to learn about and that whatever the date is, is the date. So if you say, okay, I'm interested in learning more about whey protein, but what, what do I want to look for? Whey protein, there are hundreds and thousands of different articles on whey protein. Well, you see here that I narrow the topics. I say topics three to six may focus on protein denaturation, structure function relationship in different food systems, thermal stability, bioactivity, allergenicity, cutting edge proteomics, or protein modification. So whey protein, let's see if some folks looked at thermal stability solubility and thermal stability linking structure to function. That would be a topic. So, so it's not open-ended, not whey protein open-ended. You have to focus on these uh, kind of uh, topics and select one. Obviously, you won't find one article that looks at uh, allergenicity and structure function relationship. No, either or. Um, so this is very important to kind of think about with your team member or members between now and next Wednesday, uh, what topic you want to focus on. Now, it's if I go back to the syllabus here uh, really quick. Uh, I need to, to make sure that the dates are correct here again. My apologies for that. If I go back to the syllabus, what what articles you want to choose. So we really want to focus on two articles. If you are a group of two, if you're a group of three, then there will be three articles. And not older than 2015. You want things relevant. You don't want something more than six years old. Um, so, and it has to be a scientific peer reviewed journal article, not a review article. You are going to be um, discussing and presenting research articles, um, not, not at all um, review articles, and published in high impact factor journals. Why I underline and bold this? Because there's a lot of articles out there and a lot of like open access article and some articles are not even reviewed by uh, scientists in the field. So we don't want junk, basically. We want sound research. Um, I want you to be very careful in selecting these papers so that when we uh, present this research, we all learn. So, um, so we, we want it to be a learning kind of um, presentation for, the, uh, for, the, for everybody in the class, not just for you who is presenting. So for that reason, you want to be able to capture some knowledge that we learned in class and highlight that. So, um, so it's very important to link what we learn in class to these articles that you have selected and you're presenting on to enhance the learning of everybody in the class, basically. So the reason this year that I chose to put suggested articles, so you see here there will be on Canvas suggested article to choose from. Um, the reason I did it this year, I spent kind of a, all day looking up articles and selecting them carefully because in the past students would select articles that have a lot of flaws in them and it turns out to be published in journals 
not so great and, um, and of low value. So there's not a lot of learning that we can get out of that. It's just a waste of time. So this time what I did, if you go back to the Canvas website, so I have the presentation information here where I have all the information I'm talking about, but I also have the suggested articles. So I have suggested articles for different topics, enzymatic modification, physical modification, structural function relationship, allergenicity, proteomics, purification. Uh, so the, the span is wide. So I selected maybe over 24 different articles. So you don't have to pick two from here, but at least try to pick one and find one that complements it, that tells a story. So you want two articles or three articles in the case of the three students that tells a story that you want to convey and strengthen some information we learned in class. So use this kind of as your reference and guide. You might select one, you might select two, you might not select any, but at least you have an idea of what I'm really looking for in terms of quality of the articles. But again, remember, there is no perfect in, in life and there are going to be articles that are not necessarily great, but there's some learning behind them. And here, it uh, again, in this uh, part, it describes what the presentation should include, an overview of the cases, justification, hypotheses, objectives, experimental design major finding, and very importantly, your critique. So it's important to include your personal opinion of the work. Is it feasible? What are the applications? What, the, what should they look for next? And make sure you uh, enforce concept learned in class. Throughout the presentation, make sure to link everything you're talking about, or most of what you're talking about, to, to things and elements we learned in class. Um, yeah, that is basically the most important purpose of this presentation is to add to the knowledge we cover in class. Um, so within the first week, if you can uh, select a topic and first come first serve in terms of topic, we don't want to repeat topics. So we want six unique presentations on six unique topics. Then we can assign you a date and then you can start uh, anytime you like start working on it. Uh, but we need to, you need, once you decide on a topic, you also need to consult with me once you decide on the uh, articles that I would review them with you and say, okay, they are good to go for your topic and uh, start working on it. And anytime you feel comfortable, you have your layout, you have your content, content, you can set up a time with me and we can go over the content of your presentation together at least a week prior to presenting. So we need to at least have a week to go over it together. I wanna to make sure that it conveys the right message and the right learning to the class. So all of the information you need is here. If you are a group of two, make sure you don't present more than eight minutes uh, or at least eight minutes, no longer than 10. So 20 minutes maximum. And we are strictly gonna time you for that, and uh, we will have five to 10 minutes questions after each presentation. If you are a group of three, it will be up to 30 minutes of presenting and five to 10 minutes or a little bit longer for that particular team. Again, I uh, strongly encourage you to read this in, in detail. And if you have questions, you let me know. As usual, those of you that know me from other classes, I love participation just because I don't want to speak at you like I'm doing right now. It's boring, I know. So I like I like feedback. I like questions. I like you to answer my questions and raise discussion points. This is important, but I associate that with uh, with credit with uh, points. So you get a point for every participation up to. I believe um, 40 points in terms of participation. And then attendance is encouraged. Obviously you're adults, so you can do whatever you wanna do, but it would appreciate involvement and attendance. And 
up to 10 credit points can be earned for overall involvement in the course and attendance. Um, extra credit, I love extra credit because I want you to do the work and, and benefit from the learnings and also feel like, oh, I got rewarded. It's not part of the grade, it's an extra credit. So uh, that's why I post up to 30 points in extra credit. And also for an attendance in a day, I can walk in to the Zoom or to the room and say, okay, today everybody's in present will get five extra credit points. Here's the scale. It's a little bit different than an undergraduate um, class where a B minus is actually 74 to 77%, um, unlike 80 to 84% or 80. Yeah, 80 to 84 percent or something like that for a regular undergraduate class. So you can look at that to see the, how the grading is going to impact your letter grade. Um, for presentation, there we will fill this table once we get confirmed, confirm the topic and the date, and I'll post that on Canvas. And another thing is I want you to have a look at the evaluation form. This is what the form that we'll be using to evaluate your presentation. So uh, the way it's going to work is everybody's going to evaluate everybody else. And if you are a presenter, you're going to evaluate yourself and your team member. Um, so if you are a presenter, you write your name here because then I know that it, this is your grade for yourself and your team. Uh, so I will um, send this out before a presentation so everybody has electronic copy at least of the presentation form. And the way it works is um, I grade you as well and I reserve 50% of the grade, like weight, 50% of the weight of the grade for me, 25% the weight is your grade, and 25% the weight uh, is the grade that is given by the class. So if the class gave you, and let's say 70 out of 77, 75, I think, I don't know, 70 points. If they gave you 60 out of 70 points and, I gave, and you gave yourself 70 out of 70, then the weight would be 65. And if I give you 65, then the grade is 65 out of 70. And that's an example. Okay. Um, Let's see, is there anything else? Let me look at the syllabus again. I will update the dates. I'm sorry for, for them not being updated here very well for you, but the first task is really figuring out your topic for your presentation and claiming the topic that you want. Um, these are just general uh, university policies. And there's also here the COVID uh, um, information that we were asked to include in our syllabus and I just want to point it out to you. Uh, so the class is going to be via Zoom uh, and hopefully by mid to end semester we can go in person to room 23 where I hope that at least student presentations will be in person. So we'll see how it goes. I'll keep you updated but for now we'll just count on Zoom type class. Any questions related to all of this information? I'll stop sharing for a second here. I have a question about the presentation. Yeah. I was wondering how would you go about um, selecting the topics if there are multiple groups who are interested in one topic? So but like I said, first come, first serve. So basically, if your team decide on a topic and email me, if you email me the topic and then a second group email me the same topic, I say, sorry, that was taken. Select something else. So that's how it's going to work. Now, I don't have that happen very many times um, because there's a lot to choose from and each one of you might have different interests. So I'm hoping that we don't face the situation. And if we do, there's always a way, uh, other topic that might interest you as well. Okay, what other questions do you have about the class requirement? All clear? Crystal clear. 
Okay. If you think of any questions, you can email me or ask at any time. Um, okay. I will share my screen again. And this time, I will only share the part. Okay, so this is how I like to start uh, the, usually the first lecture in proteins is show and share, but since it is via Zoom, I can't do that. I don't have samples to pass around for you to look at. And um, so I will just talk and ask my questions that I usually ask. So actually I'm just gonna stop sharing because I wanna see everybody for now, at least the first couple of minutes. All right, so if I have three ounce milk, imagine I have in my hand three ounce milk and three ounce yogurt, which of the two would have more moisture content? You can unmute yourself anytime or type if you don't wanna talk. Milk? Mm -hmm. So Nani says milk. Okay, if you agree, raise your hand. This feels like a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> it might be, you know. So who agrees with Sonali? I still want you to raise your hand if you agree. Oh, yes. All right, who says yogurt? Laura says yogurt. What about you, Moeth? Were you gonna say something? I would say they're maybe the same. Okay, I tricked you. Yes, they're the same. Why, Radhika? I can't hear you very well. Vacuum is on, but I'm going to try to be loud. I think it depends on how a yogurt is made. A yogurt is a gel, and so you're not really getting rid of any water content. As in, like cheese, you're getting rid of something. Okay, but don't go ahead yourself. Don't go to cheese yet. <laughs> Stay with yogurt. Okay, don't take the thunder from my next question. All right, so can you mute yourself, Moat? You're so loud, your background. <laughs> okay, so there's the same. Why? You want to think about how yogurt is made. You might have some little bit loss in moisture because of the heat. But in general, what you do is you lower the pH by the starter culture, right? When you have your lactobacillus bulgarius or whatever it is. Um, so what it does, it feeds on lactose, making lactic acid, and then the pH drops. And it drops to about 4.6, which is the isoelectric point of casein. So your casein now it loses the, the surface charge and now comes together and form a three-dimensional network like a 3D gel. And yogurt is a gel. It's a different type of a gel than a jelly, but it is a gel. So it entraps water. It gel entraps water. So basically, you don't have a loss in moisture unless you have cineresis and evaporation after cineresis. But it is a gel, and what keeps that texture is the protein. Okay, now the, the thunder that Radhika took from me. What has more moisture? A piece of three ounce cheese or milk? You can say now, this is not a trick question. There's lots of types of cheese. Oh, lots of that. Uh, uh, yes, okay, good. <laughs> No, let's say cheddar cheese. So which one has more moisture? Three ounce of cheddar cheese or three ounce of milk? Milk. I'm still going to go with milk. <laughs> Stay with milk, Sonali. It is milk. So in this case, what happens is when you get the, your milk, what do you do to make a cheese? You put your enzyme in there, the chymosin or rennet enzyme. So the rennet enzyme we're going to learn later on is going to chop a piece of kappa casein. That piece, the para kappa casein, is basically um, 
a, a very charged piece of casein and it's it kind of stabilizes the my the casein in my cell because the casein in my cell made, made up of many proteins interacting via hydrophobic interaction calcium phosphate bridges hydrogen bonding electrostatic and on the surface of that my cell is a lot of this kappa casein hairs by a kappa casein so and they are very ne negatively charged so they kind of keep the mycin in colloidals as a colloidal dispersed system. When the enzyme comes in, it chops off that piece, that piece of kappa casein, so you lose that charge, then the casein and micelle fuse together. They form a, not a gel in this case, it's a, a coagulant. So basically expelling out your way with the, the water that is the way that has soluble proteins and some minerals and other components and, and lactose. So basically it's a coagulant, it's not a gel, but again, what gave you that structure is the protein and the environment. So you have the protein components play an important role and then there is the environment around it that is the pH, ionic strength, um, temperature, so all play a role. So we're going to learn about the extrinsic factors that impact the protein as well as the in intrinsic factors that impact the protein and structure. Okay, so now, is there gluten in wheat? Yes. yes. Do you all agree? Raise your hand if you agree. Okay. Ali and Leslie, you don't agree. There's no. Are, are you getting at gluten forming proteins versus gluten? She's been in my lab for long. Okay, Ali. Yes. <laughs> there is no gluten in wheat. There is gluten forming protein. Gluten is the matrix that is formed when you need your, your dough, when you put your flour and you put water and you start your physical kneading of that dough, you are denaturing the protein and they're opening up. You have gliadins, you have glutenins. They open up, denature, they come together via uh, hydrogen bonding and then disulfide interchain and you form that matrix of, uh, of gluten. So usually I bring to the class uh, a dough and then gluten, how do I get the gluten out of the dough? Have you ever taken the dough and obtained a gluten blob out of it? Yeah, how do you do that, Brigida? I think we just run it under water. Yes, we just run it under room temperature or warm water. You put a piece of dough in your hand and you just start, you knead it in your hand as water is running. So all the starch come, come out of it. And you keep doing that until you get a gooey, elastic, gum-like, brownish material. It looks gross, but it is very, very elastic. And if you try to extend it, it's really elastic. It extends with you and then goes back to its shape. So that's your viscoelastic properties of the protein. And it's very, very unique to gluten. So it gives you the strength of the dough. And usually wheat, there are different classification of wheat. You have hard wheat and you have soft wheat. And they are classified based on protein content as well as protein type, which means gluten in, gliadin to gluten ratio. The more, the higher the ratio of gliadin to gluten, the more extensibility you have. The lower the gliadin to gluten ratio, the more elasticity you have. Elasticity meaning it goes, you extend it and it goes back to its original shape. Whereas extensibility such as extends and stays. So if you want to make a loaf of bread, you need to be needed to be elastic. You need to be that have strong uh, gluten network to hold the gas and have a very nice loaf volume. If you want to make pita bread, for example, the flat bread, you do not want it to be a strong gluten. You want a weaker type of gluten, so you want more gliadin and less glutenin because flat bread, you want to, um, what do you call that? Flatten it, 
and you don't want it to shrink. You want it to remain at a certain size. So for different types of products, you need different qualities of flour, not just protein quantity, but also the protein quality, the protein forming, the gluten forming protein quality profile and distribution. So you'll hear me talk about a lot about protein profile. So it's the components of the protein from different sources because you have different daily protein is not one protein. Casein is multiple casein, whey protein, multiple proteins, soy protein, infinite number of proteins. So you have a lot of proteins that come from that one source. So you hear me talking about protein profile a lot. So I'll be talking about protein profile, different components and how they impact the structure and how they impact the function. Okay, so another thing I wanna point out, so let me go to here and look at this. This is a jelly. Hmm? What do you think the percent protein is in that jelly? Does anybody want to guess? What would be the percent protein of the jelly? Or actually 10%. So Laura says 10%. 10 to 12%. 10 to 12%. Any, any other takers? So like single digits, maybe like one, yeah. Single digits, 1%. It's actually 1%. Gelatin forms a gel at really low, low protein concentrations. So that gelatin, if I had it with me now in class, I would be going around and then shaking that gel at you <laughs> upside down. And, and then you see that it won't fall. It's pretty strong gel, 1% protein, 90 some percent water and a little bit of sugar. That the protein at 1% formed this nice gel, but try to make pea protein gel. Goodness gracious, how much Brigida do we need? <laughs> how much protein do we need? We've been doing 20%. Yes, imagine how poorly pea protein uh, forms. So you need about 20%. If you have whey, it's about 5 to 10%. You can form a gel. Um, soy, 10 to 15%. You can form a gel. So what what dictates this is basically the protein characteristics, not just the external, uh, of course, you need to have the right pH, right temperature, right ionic strength. We talk about all of these extrinsic factors, but there is intrinsic factors to the protein itself that may or may not allow it to form a good gel. Okay, um, let's see what else I have. Uh, in mind what I would bring, hmm. um, a beverage. Okay, let's go see if I have a picture of a beverage here. I don't, uh, not on this slide. So a beverage, basically, uh, you've heard of high protein beverages, right? So if you want to make a claim, what's the percentage of protein you need to make a claim? Does anybody know? I know one of you knows, but <laughs> looking at Ali here to help out. Kenzie was gonna say something. What? Is it 20%? What? Is it 20%? Oh, that's a, that's really high. You can you you can form a 20% protein solution, but it won't stay stable for you for a long time. It's very high concentration. But if you want to make like an excellent source of protein on a beverage, uh, Ali, what would be the percent protein? It's 4.2% protein. 4.2% protein. So in our lab, when we measure solubility, we always measure it at around 5% protein to be a little bit higher than what can be claimed on a beverage as high protein uh, beverage or excellent source of protein. But you know, you're looking out there and see what protein can really form an acidic beverage that is stable over time. I will get to that question later. I have a question. I don't want to spoil it. But different proteins are soluble at different um, 
protein concentration. Uh, so if you increase the protein concentration, some, some proteins are soluble at 5%, at 10% protein. Other proteins are not even soluble at 1% protein. They would just fall out of solution depending on your pH. So again, that is based on in, intrinsic factors. But we also have extrinsic factors such as maybe a little bit of salt can help. Like you see phosphate salts are added to beverages to help with solubilization. Uh, you also have stabilizers such as carrageenan put in chocolate milk at pH 7, so they kind of stabilize the protein. Um, or pectin can be added, uh, pectic acids or pectate can be added to acidic beverages. So you add stabilizers, you add salt, you adjust the pH, so there are environmental factors, but but no matter what you do, sometimes that protein is not gonna go into solution for you. That is would be related to intrinsic factors. So a lot of, a lot of factors impact how the protein uh, behaves basically. Uh, okay, I'm gonna start the lecture now. So we will learn as we go We will learn a lot about functional properties and you will learn about structure that impact the functionality and you will know or determine the importance of this functionality for different food systems. So when we talk about beverages, concentrate, shakes, we're looking at the protein to be soluble, to be fully dispersed in water and remain soluble over storage and post heat treatment because all the beverage needs to be pasteurized or sterilized. We talk about water holding capacity. This is imp excuse me, important in applications where you really want to hold the water. Like if you're making meat patty, for example, you want to make sure that you don't get cinereses um, of the meat. It doesn't look good in the package to see water coming out of that meat, which would look uh, bloody. And you don't want to see it when also cinereses when you cook the meat product or um, or even meat alternative product. So you want your water holding capacity becomes a good functional property to see how the, you will have cinereses. For example, in yogurt can happen as well. Gelation is important for different food systems listed here. Uh, emulsification, foaming. So all of these characteristics are important for different food applications, food systems. All right, so let's see here. You can unmute yourself or you can use the text box, but I don't have a text, the chat in front of me, I'll have to pull it, but protein functionality in food systems can be affected by the denaturation state of the protein, the R group, of the amino acids or the number of free thiol groups. Let's see what you guys think. All of the above. Radhika, is that you? Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's all of the above. And we'll learn about all of these um, together throughout. So just as a reminder to everybody, um, what does an amino acid look like? So. An amino acid, okay, amino acid has your chiral carbon. So the chiral carbon, basically you have an H, you have an R group, you have an amine group, you have a carboxyl group. Just a second. My daughter is eating chips behind me. <laughs> so, okay, so the R group, determines functionality because the R group here can be an H, for example, like in glycine, or it can be a long chain, uh, which makes it um, like isoleucine, for example, leucine and isoleucine, which make, make it uh, hydrophobic and interact via hydrophobic interactions. And it can have an additional amine group, uh, such as in the case of arginine and lysine, where it makes it a basic amino acid and positively charged. So it would be interacting with uh, positive uh, negative charge groups. 
Number of thiols, this is your uh, sulfidyl group. So you'll hear me say sometimes sulfidyl groups, thiol, SH group, they all mean the same thing. The thiol groups are important because they can form disulfide linkages, can be oxidized, and then can be reduced. So play an important role in oxidation reduction reactions and stabilization of the protein tertiary structure and forming protein-protein uh, interactions. So these are all important characteristics towards functionality, and we'll talk about that uh, a lot. So which of the following is true? A good emulsifier is a good foaming agent. A protein that forms a strong gel is also a good emulsifier. A protein with low surface hydrophobicity is a good emulsifier. What do you guys think? Any? It could be a trick question. Is that none of the above? <laughs> sure, it's none of the above. <laughs> okay, good. So yes, there is no guarantee, nothing in the structure and function of the protein dictates that a good emulsifier is a good foaming agent, although they are related in a sense that they both are related to surface properties of the protein and both require some sort of surface hydrophobicity to surface hydrophilicity balance. So components that like water versus component that does like water. But the phases are different. In foaming, you have air versus aqueous. In an emulsion, you have water, aqueous, and oil, either oil and water or water and oil. So you need, there are different characteristics of the protein that would make it a very good emulsifier, but maybe so-and-so foaming agent and so on. Uh, Strong gel may be also a good, not necessarily. You might form a strong gel, but you might need to do something to the protein to make it emulsify and enhance its surface properties. So it's not a necessity. Um, actually, the third one, high surface hydrophobicity, nor low nor high, you really want to have a balance. You want to make sure that you have enough hydrophobicity in the surface as well as some hydrophilicity as well. Because it's a, if it's a very hydrophobic on the surface, yeah, it will interact with the oil. It may interact with the aqueous a little bit. But then when you form your droplets, they will coalesce. They will easily coalesce via hydrophobic interactions if we don't have any electrostatic repulsion. So we need that balance. So this is something that uh, I usually, when I start a talk on proteins in an invited talk, I like to give perspective. So this whole class is on proteins and I've been teaching it for many, many years, even before coming here, I taught it at Purdue as well, 14, 15 years ago. So it is good, well, at that time, 14, 15 years ago, proteins were not really hot. So they were like, okay, appreciated, but now the protein is getting a lot of buzz. So I thought it's very uh, appropriate to put perspective uh, to, why, to what's happening in the protein world um, globally um, in terms of demand. So we're seeing a very, very steep demand in proteins, whether animal source or or plant source, but the global demand of the protein is really increasing steeply. And as of now for the 7.8 billion uh, you, uh, the demand is over 200 million tons in different forms that is. And it's growing and there is uh, a publication somewhere I read that in 2030, there will not be enough protein for the population. We have to do something about it basically find hence the need to find alternative proteins. So if we're seeing that the global protein ingredient demand, so this is the global protein demand in different forms, but specifically if we look at ingredient, 
So from plant and animal sources, we are expected to see about 7 million uh, tons in demand by 2025, like in five years. Associated with this growth is a uh, market uh, growth of about reaching about $70 billion by 2025. And if we look at the rate of growth is about 8% annually. So this is a huge. If we look at plant protein ingredients specifically, they represent about 40% of the global protein ingredient market. So why? Why do you think, let's have this kind of conversation. I'm just going to stop sharing, for example, for now. So why do you think you have this global increase in protein demand? You have a growing population. So growing population is one, but what about this growing population? They want to feed on more healthy products and they are looking for more protein sources in their diet. Perfect. So protein is associated with health. Um, definitely more than fat or carbohydrate is associated with a good good health. But in terms of health, what do you, what, what specifics? If we look at the population, if we look at the aging population, protein helps uh, prevent uh, muscle deterioration, which is very common in elderly. So, so that's one part of linking protein to, to health, especially for our elderly population. That's one thing. Um, what else can you think of? The demand is increasing for protein. We're talking about health, um, association with good metabolism, for example, regeneration and preventing degradation of muscles, uh, overall uh, good metabolism, uh, good health. So health, growing population, growing aging population. Can you think of anything else? Growing allergenicity, we want newer sources. Okay, so look, this answers why we're looking at alternative sources, yes. So we look at alternative sources basically for um, allergenicity purposes. Um, I don't know also if for is... energy and for skin health. Meat alternatives, the food trend, yeah, so the meat alternative, this answers the global increasing global demand for plant proteins, but just general protein. I'm going to share back my screen, my screen here. Are you no. looking for like combating protein calorie malnutrition? Protein calorie malnutrition. So yes, substitute, again, we're talking about health. Yes, for health reasons, consuming more protein is looked upon as healthy. But again, I always caution folks when I give a presentation and I say, Okay, protein is great, it's better than, uh, it's been associated with health more than fat and carbohydrate is, but anything is excessive is not good. So if you just eat a lot of protein, that might put um, the pressure stress on your kidneys, for example. So everything in moderation. So I'm just going to show you here. Um, So population, uh, recognition of protein role in healthy diet, we talked about that. Socioeconomic changes. So you see rising income, uh, increased uh, urbanization and aging population. So changes in this socioeconomic has led to people looking for more protein in their diet or at least affording uh, protein like meat in their diet. <coughs> Animal demand, animal protein has been increasing in developing countries, whereas in developed countries, there we see an increase in demand of alternative protein. So that is the difference between developing versus uh, developed countries in terms of their demand. So if we're talking now about plant protein specifically, right? So we talked about in general, global protein demand increasing. But if we talk about plant proteins in general, and you hear that a lot, plant-based diet, alter meat alternative, dairy alternative, all of these alternatives. So why is that? So looking at the consumer, you have have you heard of vegetarians? Uh, sorry, flexitarian before the diet, a flexitarian diet. 
Who doesn't know what a flexitarian diet is? What is a flexitarian diet then? Let me ask that way. When somebody says I'm a flexitarian, what does it mean? Is it a protein diet? Say that again. I don't know who was talking. Regina? No, it was me. I was just asking if it's a high protein diet. Well, no, not really. It's a um, someone who they still eat meat and animal products, but they'll kind of flex back and forth between being someone who eats that. They might have a couple of meals vegetarian in a week. They kind of bounce back and forth. Yeah. So basically, flexitarian that mostly would prefer if you go to a restaurant and you're a flexitarian, you you look for the vegetarian option. But that doesn't mean like once a week or twice a week you get meat, but mostly your preference is for um, plant-based. So you have a preference for plant-based, but you're okay with consuming meat once in a while. So this proportion, this category of the of population has increased. So not only vegetarians, but also flexitarian. And that they increased because the consumer is looking for healthy diet and they associate plant-based diet with healthy diet. So I see something in the chat coming in. Okay, no worries. Um, okay, so let's go back. Uh, well, I want I flipped from from seeing all of you to my slides. I miss teaching from my office because I can have multiple screens. Anyway, um, so growing interest in sustainable environment uh, sources. So the, there's a lot of awareness to the sustainable, to the environment and the benefits of the environment. So basically getting away from uh, the agriculture system and the animal use, uh, animal welfare, um, contribution of high gases to the environment, um, green footprint uh, or carbon footprint. So basically the, the consumer is more and more aware from it to aware of the environment and thus they're seeking environment friendly sources and sustainable sources that are plant based. Uh, rising incidences of allergenicity and that's what one of you uh, mentioned earlier, yes, because of allergenicity to a lot of the common proteins. Uh, consumers are looking to increase protein in their diet, but yet the protein that is not allergic, they are not allergic to. So, but also we have to always keep in mind the consumer, but as well as the producer, because producers uh, want to address consumers' demand. So if consumers are looking for plant-based protein, plant-based diet, then the producer now is seeking those alternative proteins, plant proteins, and hence there's a lot of research in this area right now, looking for redu reduced cost, feasibility for production. Um, finding this unique, everybody, now we have at the center, for example, at the Plant Protein Innovation Center, we have companies from different, uh, come to us from different parts of the, of the US, even international. And they're always asking this question is that how can we be unique? We need to find this unique protein that is going to uh, give us a lot of revenue and make us competitive in the marketplace. So that's kind of the, the focus for many uh, ingredient producers. So uh, valorizing byproduct is a huge, now they're looking at every single byproduct that they their process is uh, giving them that can potentially be added value a product, getting the protein out of it so that they can uh, valorize that byproduct. For example, soy started like that. It started with soy uh, being used for oil production. And then this meal was discovered later. It has very nutritious protein that can be functional. So that byproduct became the high value ingredient rather than the oil, the protein became the high value ingredient. And then now I think BSM is going to in this year or maybe next year release uh, canola protein. 
ingredients. So the same thing, you get the canola oil, you have the meal, get the protein out and have a very, very nice protein ingredient. Uh, so looking at benefiting from a low, low value product and making it a high value product is, is a big deal for these producers. And then clean labels. So those big CPG companies, they're looking for ingredients that they can use that the consumers understand what they are. They are uh, natural ingredients that they can list on their label and the consumer can understand uh, the names and therefore you and they have less number of ingredients on the ingredient list. So proteins being functional are being looked at as replacers for chemical ingredients. And again, what we talked about population reaching 10 billion by 2050. So basically looking at alternative sources of protein to feed this population. Meat is not gonna go away. We, can, we are going to continue consuming meat as a population. However, if we don't do anything to increase the protein sources, basically we will run into a problem in 2030. So another thing you'll hear me talk about is a lot of applications. So looking at the protein structure, looking at the function, and then what, what, how is that relevant? It's relevant to, to an end product, right? So we're going to talk a lot about examples of these applications. But some of the, the applications that are growing right now for, for plant protein are meat alternatives. So meat alternatives, no surprise, they're growing at a high rate and it is said that one third of the market by 2050 would be dominated by the sector. Protein beverages is another big one. It's been big one for years and it continues to be. And if you look at the market value by 2025, it would be greater than $2 billion. Um, $2 billion. Dairy analogs, it's huge. Um, the, alternatives to milk, like oat beverage, for example, or almond beverage, they're all alternative to milk. Um, and alternatives to dairy cheese, alternative to dairy yogurt, ice cream, and such. So dairy analog is a big thing as well. Not to forget the uh, snacks, protein bars, uh, extruded products for, for breakfast cereals and, and the sort. So this is also, these are also part of the, the trendy applications. But if, if you're a producer and you hear the consumer saying, I don't want soy and I don't want gluten, for good or bad reasons, that's the notion right now. And I don't think it's, um, it, it is, it's frustrating actually to just uh, go to the supermarket and look at a, um, a nut-based snack snack that has nuts, it doesn't have any type of cereal and they put on it gluten-free. It's kind of you're promoting, they are promoting the ignorance, which is which gets really, really frustrating at times. Like, of course there's no gluten in, in, the, in nuts. And why are you saying that? It's just to make the consumer, oh, no gluten, very good, let's have that. As if gluten is this toxic component of food, but it's not, people have allergies to gluten, sensitivity to gluten, celiac disease, but it's, if you're not ill, gluten is not gonna hurt you. And with soy, it's the notion against a GMO, genetic modified, more than 90% of the soy produced in North America is genetically modified. And um, also both proteins are on the, big eight list for FDA for allergens that represent, those eight allergens represent more than 90% of the other reported allergenicity to protein. So because consumers are seeking these alternatives, uh, seeking alternatives to soy and gluten, they are, um, they're making, the producers are seeking to formulate with alternatives plant-based proteins that are not soy and not gluten, which brings a lot of challenge as in terms of structure and functionality, which we will give a lot of examples throughout the semester. Okay, let's have a little bit of a discussion here.
Okay, so what are the most common protein ingredients you know of? Whey protein isolate and concentrates. Okay, whey protein isolate and concentrate. Very good. What else? Milk protein concentrates. Milk protein concentrates, yes. Eggs. Egg protein, yes. Especially egg white protein, yeah. What else? Soy protein isolate. Soy protein isolate concentrates and isolates and flour because flour is high in proteins, about 40 to 50% protein. Okay, so we said soy, we said whey, we said egg, we said, what else? Meats. Okay, yes, gelatin, for example. All right, what else? Pectin. What that, what that, Brigida? Pectin. Pectin is not a protein. Gelatin is a protein. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Got confused with something. Uh, pea protein, isolate yeah. and concentrates. Okay, so these are not traditional, but they are now becoming very relevant. But among the traditional, you said whey, but there's also caseinates. So caseinates is among the most uh, common in traditional protein ingredients. So you have whey and you have caseinates. That's your main daily ones. Um, you have soy, you have gluten. So these are all common traditional proteins. So what about the emerging? We said pea, but what else have you heard of? Chickpea protein. Chickpea protein, yes. So we have- Potato protein. Potato, yes. So we have legumes, okay? So let's classify them as pulses. So pea is a pulse, chickpea, uh, lentils, beans. So these are um, mung bean, like the feva bean. So these are all pulses and they're all being looked at as sources of plant proteins with the, the main one in the forefront is pea, but then they're gonna be more pulses catching up to pea pretty soon. Okay, other than legumes and pulses, what did we hear? What's that? Potato. I heard potato protein. Uh, Grace, what did you say? Uh, like bugs. Well, insect. Yes, insect proteins. So definitely. So potato is big in Europe, but it's not so much here in the U.S. just because of the supply. Because think about it. Protein in potato is about 1%, <laughs> 1 to 2%. And there, the reason that it is, a, it is an ingredient is because of value adding, valorizing, because they produce the starch and then there's the byproduct that has some protein in it. And then they try to purify that and make an isolate, but there's not a lot out there. So it didn't make it to the market here in the US very much. What else? Oh my God. What did you say, uh, Ali? Rice protein. Rice protein. Ben? Uh, I was just going to say mycoprotein. Mycoproteins. Yes, definitely. So mycoproteins and um, let's say, so there's mycoprotein. There is also algae protein. There is the yeast generated proteins, uh, cell cultured proteins, um, and then bugs. Too. But if we want to think about other alternative proteins, the list is really, really huge. So sunflower protein is also emerging in Europe um, and soon might be in the US as well. There's a lot of interest in it. So we have the canola, we have the sunflower in terms of oil seeds, they are uh, there. Um, and then pulses, and then you have Oats, for example, Ben did not say oat. Maybe he just doesn't want to associate with oats anymore. <laughs> but yes, you have the grains, uh, different sources. Um, buckwheat, for example, is being looked at as well. Oh, the, the, it's endless. I'm even getting leaves. People are, industry folks are coming to me with some leaves to get protein out of the leaves. And do you want to work with leaves? No, they're the most complicated systems to extract protein from. So 
It is infinite, I would say. So here's your traditional list. Um, we talked about milk proteins, maybe casein and, and whey, and they're present in so many different forms. When we cover dairy protein, we'll talk about the different forms of casein and whey proteins. Uh, egg proteins, mostly egg white. There is egg yolk, but mostly egg white. The albumin is what is the main uh, ingredient, soybean. Flour, concentrate, isolates, cereal proteins, and meat proteins. So this is your traditional list, right? This is the, the list that has been there for, for years now. And now they're hydrolysates too. So you find egg white hydrolysate, soy protein uh, hydrolysate, whey protein and hydrolysate in the market as well. So alternative protein, like I said, the list is huge. Um, you have the pulses and then you have the oil seeds uh, that is coming up, canola, which is rapeseed, the non-GMO version of it from Europe, sunflower. And now in the University of Minnesota, we're working to develop two oil seeds, camelina and pennycrest, that have environmental benefit, which will be a great buzz. I mean, get a lot of attention because of the environment and the consumer awareness of environment. Then you have the cell uh, proteins, um, single cell yeast, algae, and fungal mycoprotein is not, is not single cell, it's multiple cell protein from fungus. Lab grown insect or bugs, and then the list of other is huge um, and is growing. So the second half of the this class will talk about different sources, and I will I usually talk about traditional proteins, but I will be incorporating those alternative proteins and what we know about them as well in my examples later on in the semester. So I didn't give you a break, did I? I just realized. So how about we take five minutes break and then we'll, we'll end with 20 minutes, remaining 20 minutes. So take a, take a five minutes break. I will, take, I will do the same and um, we will resume at 4.20. Seven.
Okay, let's gather back. Wait for everybody to get situated again. You're coming back, Regida. Mm, Ali and Holly. Sonali will be coming back. So let's get going and spend the next 20 minutes on um, introducing the role of proteins in food. So let's, okay. So basically muscle building, right? That's kind of the traditional thought of uh, proteins is basically mu muscle regeneration after an exercise. So that's one of the physiological benefits. And we'll see a lot of products geared towards athletes, those that are building muscles or just not necessarily building muscles, but, also, but they have heavy exercises and after a heavy exercise, they need this high protein um, input to regenerate the muscle loss. So that is a very common, um, commonly known uh, protein is famous for basically. So, but if we're looking at protein and health, we always think of protein quality and not only quantity. So when we talk about quantity, there is a kind of a requirement per daily intake, which is basically around on average 50 grams per day or one gram of protein per one kilogram of body weight. So it, it really relates to how, uh, you know, how your body is made up, uh, basically, and amount of muscle that you have as well. So, but when we think about amount, we also have to consider the quality. And if you look here, for example, in this supplement, you have 36 grams of proteins per serving, which represent 70% daily value. If you take 36 grams by 50 grams times 100, you get that you're getting 70% of your requirement in this particular uh, supplement. But there is, a, there is something very important to this amount and linking it to daily value is, your, is the PD-CAS value. So how well that protein can be digested to be basically bioavailable and how complete is this protein? So that's where we come to the PD-CAS value, which is the protein digestibility corrected amino acid score which is basically a score that takes into account the first limiting amino acid. That means the essential amino acid pre present in the lowest amount compared to a reference protein. And then the second score is the score of digestibility. So the PD-CAS has a maximum score of one because you can get a maximum score for amino acid is one and maximum score of digestibility is one or 100%. So the protein is either 100% digestible and has a score of one for digestibility or less. So then the multiplication value would be either one at maximum, that means the protein is highly available for digestion and is complete in a sense of all of the essential amino acids meet the minimum requirement for these essential amino acids. So if you look here, your milk, your milk and meat, so basically the animal-based protein are all at one or close to one. Whereas if we look at the plant-based, you have the soy, which is very close uh, to one, depending on processing. So it ranges between 0.9 to one, to one, depending on the process that might, you might lose lysine, you might, um, I mean, degrad degradation of lysine that is, or you might generate protein that is highly polymerized that will not be 100% digested. So that's why the PDCAS is dependent on processing, not just uh, the PDCAS of the protein as is in the original crop or the original source. Um, 
And then if you look at the rest of the plant protein, then they go downhill. If you look at wheat, for example, it is even is around 0.4 or less. So plant proteins in nature, first of all, there are they could be limiting in amino acid. Uh, lysine and methionine would be the most common ones that are uh, usually deficient. And they, they have, due to their structure, they might not be as digestible or as readily digestible without uh, further processing. So in terms of physiological function, we have, as I said, the, the uh, muscle growth and um, regeneration. And also you have the, um, the prevention of deterioration, so re reduction of muscle deterioration aging population. Uh, weight loss and metabol metabolic health, that, so proteins is associated with that. And also the fact that they're are bioactive peptides. So basically when the protein is chopped off, uh, you can um, get some sequences that would have a physiological contribution, either act as an um, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-hypertensive, um, antidepressant, or even promote satiety. And these peptides can actually be generated in vitro. That means you can hydrolyze the protein and produce a hydrolysate and then consumed as a supplement or in a, or added to a product. Or they can be generated as we digest the protein. These small peptides can be generated and absorbed intact. They would be usually tripeptide, meaning a three amino acid or four amino acid. Uh, that can be absorbed without further digestion. The physiological uh, characteristics, uh, sometimes they are approved by FDA. For example, in, the, in soy, there is this FDA approved statement, 25 grams of soy protein a day as part of a diet low in saturated fatty, uh, fat acid, fatty acid and cholesterol may reduce the risk of heart disease. So a few years ago, the FDA wanted to uh, remove that uh, the statement, uh, but it got a lot of backlash from industry that there has been enough body of work that associates soy protein uh, with, with uh, health benefits, and we need a lot more studies to disprove it, um, to contradict it. So it's still a thing and you can still put it on the label um, as well to promote the use of soy protein. That after this statement has been uh, confirmed in 1999, there was a lot of uh, protein ingredient use in a lot of products because of this statement. And then there's the association of sometimes uh, some phytochemicals. For example, in soy, there is this phytochemical that acts as a phytoestrogen, has some health benefits to a certain extent, and it associates with the protein components. So an isolate will have a lot of isoflavones in it. So that, that would be, could be an added physiological benefit. In terms of um, physical uh, functional properties, so we talk about nutritional, but also now we have physical properties. Uh, one of them is the color. So a protein can be light scattering, such as the casein. For example, my cell, the, the, it kind of scatters light, so it gives you this white color. You can have chromophores, such as myoglobin and betalin. These are proteins that give the red color. And the, you have browning, so not enzymatic, uh, browning and enzymatic browning. So non-enzymatic, what would be an example of non-enzymatic browning? So Myelard reaction. Yes, Maillard reaction. Thank you. Uh, so definitely Maillard reaction is um, favored in, in some products such as the, um, here, my mouse is just acting up. Okay such as in bread, for example, you get this brown, nice color. Sometimes it's not desirable in a beverage, for example, when you have high fructose corn syrup, and if you add protein, 
in over storage of that beverage, you get that browning due to Maillard reaction. Uh, the enzymatic is through the polyphenol oxidase. So looking at a lot of produce are lost due to browning uh, reactions. Um, so here you have the apple, you cut the apple, you have the phenol, you have the enzyme, polyphenol oxidase is a protein then you get this brown color. And if you know Granny Smith is engineered so that it has less amount of polyphenol oxidase. We'll talk a little bit more about polyphenol oxidase when we cover enzyme kinetics. Sometimes these enzymatic reactions, the polyphenol oxidase reaction is desirable, such as in tea, for example, it is desirable to get this brown color. In terms of flavor, so, um, Bitter is associated with hydrophobic uh, amino acids. So for example, that's why hydrolysates are associated with bitterness because when you hydrolyze and you release peptides that are composed mostly of hydrophobic amino acid, gives you that bitter taste. Uh, sourness is basically associated with the percent of acidic amino acid that you have. And also you get sourness based on how much you hydrolyze the protein because that would release carboxyl groups that would give you that sour taste. Sulfur taste, which is cysteine. So egg protein, for example, is high in cysteine. So you have that sulfur note there. Uh, glutamate, which is uh, related to umami flavor. And that would be specifically monosodium glutamate that is made of a glutamine and a sodium. So that's glutamate. Um, proteolysis. So when the cheese ripens, you have endogenous enzymes. The enzymes you added during the manufacture of cheese, then you uh, get that fermented over time and gives you a very characteristic flavor to, to that cheese. Sweetness, for example, aspartame, which is a dipeptide between aspartic acid and phenylalanine that has a very unique um, sweet taste. Most importantly, other than color and flavor, um, okay, but going back to flavor here a little bit. So I was hearing one of uh, our graduate students seminar talking about if you type uh, protein taste on Google, you get all of the sorts of bad things. Protein tastes bad, tastes awful, tastes horrible. But really the protein doesn't have much taste beyond this that I pointed out here to you. So a protein doesn't really taste anything, um, anything in particular, other than in, unless you hydrolyze the protein, then you get taste, you're fermented, you get taste, you have monosodium glutamate. But protein as an intact protein by itself, it doesn't have any taste or flavors, but definitely not uh, aroma forming, so it doesn't, it's not, volatile, so it doesn't have a flavor, an aromatic flavor. And the taste is really depending on the composition. So what really tastes bad or undesirable is whatever comes with that protein from its original source. So whatever components are associated with the protein, and if they are volatile, then they, they have this unique flavor that might not be desirable, such as beanie flavor, for example, in legumes. So that's one thing I wanted to point out is really the protein by itself is not bad in terms of taste. Um, so important fun properties are the physical functional properties. So basically contributing to the texture of the final product. So we have water binding, gelation, coagulation. So these are important for in gels and coagulum in cheese, and here is a, a tofu gel, for example. So this is very important for protein to be able to form that three-dimensional uh, form that holds water and gives you a specific or unique texture, whether it's a gel like a yogurt gel or whether it is a gel like a jelly or a tofu gel. Um, Solubility is very important here too, because if you want to form this beverage, in this case, a clear beverage, um, you need to have a protein that is soluble in at acidic condition and not form a cloudy uh, base. So you want a clear beverage, you want a soluble protein at that particular pH. 
emulsification and foam. Ice cream, for example, is a system where you have emulsification and foaming. As well as a cake system, you also have emulsification where the batter, you have fat, you have aqueous, you want to put them together, and then also you're incorporating air. So you need that protein to be able to do that. Viscoelastic properties, we talked about the bread. Do you want it flat bread? Do you want the loaf bread? So that dictates the type of protein quality you want in your wheat sample. So all of these interactions, basically you have interaction with proteins and water, protein and fat, protein and air, protein, water, protein interactions. So all of these interactions uh, happening even with protein and carbohydrate interactions. Uh, so all of these interactions dictate the final structure, final texture that you get. And the interactions are either hydrophobic interaction, ionic interaction, hydrogen bonding, or covalent in some cases, such as in formation of gels and formation of films around an oil droplet or an air droplet. So this, this, these types of interaction, these are the interactions that dictate the final texture of in, in a particular product. And we'll talk a lot about these interactions. Nothing comes without anti-things, uh, anti anti-nutritional factors. Uh, so the protein can be anti-nutritive, such as an enzyme inhibitor is a protein, but it is an anti-nutritive factor. Uh, because if you have trypsin inhibitor, which is present abundantly in soy, uh, you need to inhibit it. Otherwise, when you consume a product with high trypsin inhibitor, it's going to inhibit the trypsin in our gut and disrupt digestion and protein and will give us digestive uh, tract problems. Uh, amylase inhibitor will inhibit digestion of starch, for example. So these are proteins and we, they need to be inactivated before consumption of the source. Allergenic proteins, so here I list dairy, soy, wheat, peanuts, eggs. You also have tree nuts and shellfish um, as well as part of the big eight allergens. So the list is, will be growing, I'm telling you now, because 50 years ago, soy was not a big allergen. But once, once people that are not used to consuming soy started consuming soy protein and they were present in so many different products, then allergenicity started to manifest. So the more we consume of proteins we don't usually consume, there is a potential to develop allergenicity. Uh, toxic components, so amino acids can be precursors of toxins, just as nitrosoamine compounds that could come from nitrates treated cured meat, heterocyclic amines that could result when you are cooking um, uh, or roasting um, meat and you have high temperature and then you can get uh, protein interactions or it's like sort of a Maillard reaction, interaction that would lead to the production of heterocyclic amines. Um, lectins, these are components, also proteins present in um, seeds or, or beans, green beans they can cause inflammatory type of reaction in the gut. Uh, other toxins, evident for example, anti-nutritive, not necessarily toxin, anti-nutritive is a protein found in eggs. It can bind to the vitamin biotin, rendering it not biologically available. Histamine found in fish products can cause vasoactive um, reaction. So, these are things to keep, uh, to remember that everything has some sort of disadvantages. And in this case, the anti-nutritional factors that comes with the proteins, with particular proteins. So what we will be talking about throughout the semester is really relating your protein structure to functionality, relating that structure as it is impacted by intrinsic factors. So the native type or the native form. So the native form meaning the protein before it's, uh, it saw any type of processing, any type of modification. And 
this structure is dictated by the source. So we're going to talk about different sources. Uh, of proteins, and these different sources have different protein composition, uh, not necessarily only amino acid composition, but the sequence of amino acid, where they are in the sequence of the protein, it impacts how the protein is going to form a secondary structure, a tertiary structure, quaternary structure, intermolecular and intramolecular. So inter meaning between different proteins, among different proteins, and among protein and water, protein, carbohydrate, protein and fat, etc. And intra uh, interactions, uh, that means um, intramolecular interaction, that means within the same molecule, interactions within the same molecule, for formation of disulfide linkages internally that will add to thermal stability, for example. So the composition and the sequence of amino acids dictate uh, the molecular configuration the hydrophobicity, total hydrophobicity, surface hydrophobicity, they're two different things. How much, some proteins have high, high total hydrophobicity, but in fact, all of it is in, inside the moiety of the protein. That means you form a globular shaped protein. Most of your hydrophobic residues are on the inside. So surface hydrophobicity is important uh, versus total hydrophobicity. Also, the amino acid composition dictate how many ionizable groups you have, how many sulfide groups I have, how many um, um, amine groups, extra carboxyl groups that will result in ionization at different pH conditions, resulting in different molecular interactions. So when we talk about protein structure, we take into account intrinsic factors, and these are the intrinsic factors, the factors that impact the native form of the, of the protein. Then what we have, we have extrinsic factors. So proteins don't exist in a bubble. They exist in an environment. So you have a specific pH, you can change temperature, can apply, you can change the ionic strength. And with that, you change configuration of the protein. You might have different ionization, different surface properties, when you have different pH and different ionic strength, for example. Uh, temperature can cause denaturation. That means it open, the protein opens up and, uh, and expose different groups that might cause different sorts of interactions. We process, we isolate the protein, we dry, we use solvents, we extrude. Um, so there are different things we can do for the, to the protein that will impart the structure, changing it from a native form to a denatured or modified form, um, especially when we apply modifications ourselves, when we really put an enzymatic uh, or implement enzymatic reaction, chemical, physical, other natural reactions, when we induce them, then we are physically or chemically changing the protein. So when we do that with extrinsic components and uh, induced modification, we are changing the structure of the protein. With that, we're impacting functionality. So a native protein has unique functionality. A modified protein has unique functionality. So it is not constant. Protein structure function is not constant. So the different functional properties are organoleptic, like uh, what kind of taste and color we get out of uh, these interactions that the protein might have with, with each other and with other components. Um, hydration properties, so that has to do relation with water. Um, solubility, water holding, water binding as well, although it's not there, but it is under hydration. Surface properties, emulsification, foaming, uh, uh, oil binding, flavor binding, these are all have to do with surface properties of the protein that can be impacted by denaturation and modification. Structural properties, we talk about viscoelasticity, viscosity, gelation, these, these contribute to the final structure of the food matrix. This is kind of a definition of food fun uh, protein functional properties. So what is that? 
is basically any physical chemical property which affects processing, behavior of food system as we judge it by the quality attributes of the final product. Okay, so this is kind of a slide that you'll see quite a bit um, from now till the end of the semester, linking things together, putting things in perspective from intrinsic to extrinsic to modified protein, to what happens to the structure, to what happens to the function, to what happens in an application. So that's the whole story is right there. And with that, it's a good stopping point. We can start uh, next time here. Okay, thank you all. We get started next week. I will start the Zoom at 2.50 to get you all settled in and hopefully start right on time at 2.55. So thank you all and I'll see you next week. Bye.